And I'm from Sports Science Agency. Uh, Mark asked me to come and talk to you today about, I guess, the transfer from sports science to sports marketing and how this industry is exploding and I think will continue to explode over the coming years. So to start with just a little bit about Sports Science Agency. So we're a unique sports marketing agency. Um, we use the science of sport, technology and data to, as we say, tell performance stories. So we work with brands, broadcasters, rights holders and other agencies across the sports marketing world to plug in this expertise gap because honestly sports marketing is terrible at knowing anything about sports science. I mean earlier we talked a little bit about um, the, the, the dislocation between a sports science team and a coaching team. Imagine the difference between a sports marketing team and the sports science team or the coaching team and a club. They just do not talk to each other but the opportunities for everybody in this space are huge. Um, so in the UK in particular, this industry started to, to boom really off the back of the marginal gains program at British Cycling. Does everybody know, heard of marginal gains at British Cycling? The aggregation of data so that you know, it's easier to change 100 things by 1% than it is 10 things by, by 10%. I was very lucky, I used to work at British Cycling. I ran the sponsorship program there. And what we saw, well, what happened really with marginal gains was it was the first real quality sports science marketing campaign that went out globally. The sports marketing world went absolutely crazy for it and could not get enough of it. But they couldn't communicate it. They didn't know what was going on. They were coming to us saying, what is it? What does marginal gains do? How does it work? It was just sports science. Sports science has existed for 50 years. We saw on the slide earlier Tom Riley in the 70s. That's marginal gains. But all of a sudden, it became a huge buzzword and brands wanted a piece of it and they wanted to be able to communicate it, but they didn't know quite how. So while I'm talking to you and showing you a few videos this afternoon, I want you to think about three things. I want you to think about the value of your message because you guys know more than you, than you really realise. I, I want you to think about the insights that your data can drive and then also think about how you can communicate that. Three things, as we go through, just keep those in mind. So, how's data being used in sports marketing? It's always easier for someone else to say it rather than me, so I've got a video. Which hopefully has sound. Oh no. And right there now, there's basically a one size fits all solution. But as we know, we don't all like the same thing. in an on-demand world. And that's a fundamental, almost inalienable right today that was non-existent 20 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. With the information age, big data has its force. The problem is that data itself is not valuable to people. It's the ability to use <coughs> data to turn the content into things people care about. What we're bringing at Second Spectrum is the ability to transform data into capabilities that can really change people's experiences. The good news is you can get very specific and you can get target exactly what you want, when you want it, and where you want it. That bridge is essentially a computer that understands the game. Because a computer that understands the game and understands you can give you what you want. And that to me is ultimate choice. It's going to be a big part of the sporting experience. We combine machine learning, computer vision, design, user experience to create a platform that is able to understand both sports and people and transform content into ways that people actually want to experience them. That's where I see companies like Second Spectrum playing a role. They're going to continue to be that next growth area in making the experience richer and much more personal tomorrow than it is today. So, so this is what's coming, AI, computer learning. But it, think about what, what the CEO said there. He, he went back to that original message that we heard this morning. The data's nothing without someone giving you the insight and making it valuable. The technology is incredible, but actually, if you don't know what data or how the data is going to be communicated, it's irrelevant. So again, the people who are going to underpin this are the sports scientists. You guys are the most important people in the room if this is really, really going to work. So just keep, again, keep thinking about where this can go. That was a broadcast example, but it's not just about broadcast. So the sports marketing industry, generally speaking, is made up of three different, three different areas. You've got rights holders, 
teams, clubs, events, um, leagues, they want performance data because they've realized they can sell it to brands and sponsors. Brands and sponsors want it because actually the general public are dead interested in this now and they can really push product and showcase what they're all about. And the media wants it because that's become so fragmented that that's how they can drag more eyeballs to their, to their platforms, which again helps the brands communicate with them. So you know, th this whole market comes together, but at the basis of it is quality data and great insight that has to be led by sports scientists. In the end, what, why does sports marketing care about data? It's all about revenue. It's not, you know, it's, it's time in memoriam. They can see that there's more revenue streams here. Again, think about those rights holders. They all of a sudden can produce different, they can produce new sponsorship packages to sell to more sponsors. And I'll show you a couple of examples of these. The big question now is how does sports science get a piece of this? What's the opportunities for sports science? So there are two really. The first one is part of the revenue. And the second one is the expertise that comes out of the sports marketing, the sports tech, AI, machine learning. That's the second opportunity. If we can harness what those guys are doing to make what we're doing better, again, it's a virtuous circle. So I'll go back to it, but we heard it this morning, didn't we? Insight is greater than data. And I sat and listened to Alex in particular and thought, I'd rather listen to that guy tell me about football than any of these three because they don't really tell you anything you don't know. I mean, this is going to sound really bad, and I'm going to call out Jamie Redknapp, but does anyone remember, was it the Carabao Cup final a couple of years ago when Chelsea substituted Aspilicueta? They brought Asp Asp no, not Aspilicueta. Who was the keeper? Kepa. Um, Jamie Redknapp went absolutely crazy about it. It's like, oh, it's ridiculous. Why would you sub a goalkeeper in at the start of a penalty shootout? So I had a quick look at the data, and it was obvious because Kepa was so much, well, not only was he a better penalty saver than Mendy, who was in goal, Mendy was terrible, absolutely terrible. So you had a substitute to go, and all the data makes that decision so obvious. Yet, he tells us it's the most ridiculous decision that's ever been made by a, by a manager. Actually, not bringing, not bringing, sorry, not bringing Kepa in would have been the most ridiculous decision ever made by a manager. But... They just don't look at the data and therefore aren't giving you the power of that insight. I think what Alex said this morning about the sort of Sky Sports, how they talk about, well, look, these are the passing data. This is the running data. They're not giving you any real insight. They're not probably telling anyone in this room something that they don't know. So imagine if you get a sports scientist to actually train some of these people to tell them what is going on underneath it all. And there's the, again, that gets back to the power of it. Um, so I want to give you two examples of where data has, has, I guess, the sports science data has really got into the sports marketing world and how powerful that's been. The first one is from the UCI Track Champions League. This was a relatively new event that was made for TV. First season was two years ago. The whole point about this was that it was going to really try and engage viewers um, into the nuance of cycling. If you don't know about cycling, what's going to get you hooked? What's going to make you interesting? Because actually, just watching track cycling and people ride around, sometimes it can be a bit of a tough watch. So they really, really wanted to push a data narrative. The problem they had was they didn't know what data. So we were lucky enough to work on this um, and helped put a strategy together whereby you're talking about, we talked about primary, secondary and tertiary data. Primary you'll see just some pretty easy heart rate stuff that comes live from the athletes while they're competing, never really been done before. Secondary, we'd start to build to some comparative data and then tertiary, actually you're sort of getting under the skin of sports science. So actually rather than showing someone's maximum heart rate, which again, most of you will know is pretty irrelevant, let's look at the percentage of max heart rate. But you have to do it slowly and over time because the fans don't understand what these terms are. So you have to take them on that journey. For the organisation or for the event, the value of the data was A, hopefully more eyeballs, so more revenue, and B, a new sponsorship category that they could sell. Big numbers. In cycling, 
the track cyclists, is, especially the sprinters, they deliver a huge amount of power. And we don't really realize how much effort they put into their sprints. And thanks to the power, people can really understand what, what it means to have a sprint with their regular vessel. Cycling is all about the tactics, even in the sprint and carrying what's what's happening. And maybe in the future, if the if the data can be seen on the screen, uh, I think people understand what's happening and what uh, what you actually put on the pedals and if it's uh, if it's big or not. Um, but they can also see how much the difference is if somebody is in the wheel or if you have a gap and you can overtake somebody. Maybe you have the perfect tactic. You don't even need more watts than the rider riding in front. But yeah, we can all see it on the on the video in the future. So I'll just I'll just stop that there. So you can see that um, this is in the stadium, but this is also on, it also went out live on TV, but powered by AWS. So when I talked about those benefits, so you've got actually from a rights holder point of view, so from the event, they've been able to bring in a major sponsor and they don't get much bigger than AWS. But actually now the coaches and the athletes are benefiting from AWS's technology feeding back into them because they can crunch data that the coaches just cannot get and also because of the contracts the riders have signed everything's coming off them live so they're getting live the, co the coach is getting live in competition data we're putting together as i said primary secondary and tertiary data around to support what the coaches want and so that circle just keeps being completed um the other thing i would say because it's only fair because i slagged off some of those um some of those pundits earlier was we did a, a major job with the pundits of this as well, so they can understand what the data was saying. So again, across all those feeds across Europe, the commentators are able to discuss the data in detail, so the audience are able to understand what's going on. So I said, this is the primary stuff, because we've just got their maximum data. Season two, we're doing comparative between athletes, and now we'll start to build on, to build more predictive and more sort of deep physiological data. Um, so this is a nice example of where you've got a rights holder and a sponsor benefit. Um, it's just some more images. Again, I, I, I mentioned that the media is key. So obviously we had the broadcast feed, but then actually again for the, for the rights holder, they want to be pushing stuff out across, across all forms of media, traditional and social. And actually if you've got decent data that underpins some of the imagery, it's amazing the engagement it gets rather than just pictures of athletes and saying Harry Levason wins. Actually, if we can start talking about watts, particularly amongst a cycling audience, but we'd see it in football, we'd see it in rugby, we'd see it anywhere really, they're going to start discussing this. And that's where it's so powerful, because the engagement of anything that you do digit digitally, when you start talking about quality data, shoots up through the roof. Um, this is my last example. This is Vodafone's Player Connect system that they built for the Lions, um, I think it was last year. And this is a really interesting one, again, for the sports scientists in the room, because the benefit here is certainly from a revenue point of view. This was a multi-million pound sponsorship that meant that the Lions had access to some of the best and the latest sports science equipment that the Lions as, a, as an organisation just wasn't going to be able to afford. Vodafone come along, right, what's our message? We want to talk about our tech. We want to talk about our connectivity. How are we going to do that? We're going to use sports science as a basis. The lines can turn around and go, yep, great, we'll work with you, but we need you to go and purchase all this kit for us so that you can go and tell your story. So a brand has come in here and funded the sports science operation of one of the, well, one of the most famous rugby teams in the world. So think about that as a benefit. If you guys can get the commercials right, actually you've got big brands who will fund this. The Board from Player Connect is a first of its kind performance dashboard that uses Vodafone's IoT technology to aggregate the data from existing sports variables and serve that back up in a single pane of glass. IoT is the Internet of Things. It allows us to capture data across people, places and things and collate that data and analyze that data and present that information back 
Player Connect dashboard will give the coaching staff, the sports science team, all of the tools that they need to make sure that they're getting absolutely the best out of the athletes without the manual process of collecting data from multiple different sources and pulling it all together. Player Connect system is ingesting data from two different systems for collision. One is the microphone and the other is the GPS track that they're aware of. Okay, let's go and have a go with the first drop. Let's do it. Because we're aggregating data from lots of different sources, it means that we can get a much more holistic view of how those impacts are affecting you as an individual. So with this, this will be able to give us feedback from training as well as games as well? Yeah, absolutely. How the coaching staff can use this data is they can see whether you need to increase the number of collisions, you know, back off a little bit to make sure that you're in peak shape when it comes to the three tests against South Africa. With the GPS units, we're measuring the amount of distance that you cover, the speed that you cover, the accelerations to give us an idea of what that workload is. With the chest strap, we're measuring your heart rate and your heart rate variability and using that to work out your internal load. Combine that with your off-field recovery measures and we get a really holistic view of you as an athlete. And is that a lot of these metrics can be seen live? A lot of the detail about number of accelerations, sprint distance, that all accumulates live and then we can determine whether we need to push you harder or take some of the workload off you in order to make sure that you're recovered enough to perform at an optimal level. One of the key things on tour will be player welfare. We're using WHOOP for recovery data, so the amount of sleep that you're getting, disturbances and that sort of things. And that can inform the coach's decisions about the volume of training, the amount of recovery time that you need to make sure that all of the players on tour are performing optimally. But actually, one of the best tools that we have is just a player questionnaire, which is built into the Player Connect system. So every day, you'll go through a wellness questionnaire, which asks you some questions about your mood, your quality of sleep, how recovered you feel you are. The coaches are going to use that data to make sure that they're keeping track of well-being and your mental health that they can then step in and help out with. Awesome. Vodafone Player Connect will be used by elite athletes and teams who really want to get a handle on their performance data and importantly do so in real time and that gives us a significant step forward from where we are today. So that's an example of a major brand using sports science as its platform to tell its message over a, a, a massive campaign. Sports science was absolutely central to what they were doing and again it just shows the value. One note of caution, I would say, um, who owns the data for the athletes? So at the moment there is a move, there's a project called Project Red Card, and I could have picked, um, I could have picked the Fulham game for this, for this picture as well, but I'm an Ireland fan, so I thought I'd put this one up just to, uh, just to annoy everybody in the room. Um, but, so there is a move over who owns the data. So you, we have to think quite carefully about this, and it's an ethical question, because actually if you're putting out athletes' personal you know, and, and heart rate could be classed as medical data. Do we have the right to do that? We did it with the Track Champions League because the athletes had signed waivers. But if you're at a club and, you know, if a player has, I don't know, a low heart rate or maybe some medical issues, we just have to be careful. Um, Project Red Card is kind of pushing people to say, well, the athlete should have more control and actually be able to charge for that data in the way that they do for their image rights. We'll have to see how that plays out. But I think the the message just to think, think about here is just there are some eth ethical issues and just as long as we're not being silly and giving away you know, personal and private data, we should be okay. But sort of to emphasise Alex's point earlier, athletes are human beings, so let's treat them with, with, with some respect. Oh, one last. So how can Sports Science Agency help you guys? Well, look, as I said, we work with brands, broadcasters um, and rights holders around the world and we've, beat, we've built these We've built these programs and we've shown how si uh, sports science can be of value to both the brands and to the sports science teams. Um, we're doing a lot of work at the moment in concussion. Um, we're doing a lot of work in, in rugby. We're doing a lot of work across tech. If any of you think that we can be of any help to any of the projects that you guys are working on, if it's around funding, if it's around you know, more access to some of the technology, I'm, I'm very happy to help. Um, and for the students in the room, what I would say is this is an expanding area. You probably came in and did sports science and thought, yeah, I want to go and work with a team. You know, at some point in the not too distant future, there'll be an in-house sports scientist at Vodafone. There'll be an in-house sports scientist at O2. 
you know, there'll be in-house sports scientists at AWS, at Apple, at Microsoft. You know, the opportunities that you guys will get as this market opens up are huge and they certainly weren't around when I graduated a long, long, long time ago. Um, on that note, that's me. Um, any questions? Thanks, John, and uh, the Sports Science Agency. Uh, a very quick note for the students, and like I said before, a quick note for uh, the assessment. Data has been also statistic. For example, if you are studying statistics, maybe you wouldn't enjoy that, but it is something that will increase, will grow your portfolio in the future, increase employability. If you have studied, if you are studying performance analysis, uh, that is a market uh, that you understand uh, is maybe also the future, present and future, I could say, <laughs> from the past, present and future, and sports science, uh, you understand the, the importance of the insight of the data, knowledge to gather data. Okay, so there is a market for you that is now maybe uh, the, the, the direct job that you can see in front of you, but something that uh, is there, is outside, uh, after the university, and you can really maybe uh, open a new way for uh, your employability, uh, contacted with uh, the contact with people like uh, John and uh, also open a bit your eyes so watch around you at a 360 degree so uh, I think uh, the future in sports science is uh, quite bright there are many jobs that don't exist in this moment uh, and will exist in the future if you watch sports scientists department in the past there was maybe a coach a couple of coaches one strength condition coach no many analysts because the second coach was doing that job now the departments are much bigger, so we will have also other job in the future. Uh, so I would like to ask the first question to John, and after I let you ask other questions, the first one is how do you approach new, for example, client in the sport environment who generally are quite uh, resistant to innovation? So obviously marketing can be innovation because it is a new thing. And uh, you say that sports scientists, coaches, don't talk the same language? Definitely not. <laughs> so how can you interact with them to say, bridge a bit uh, into the club? Yeah, I think where we've been quite successful is, is we do speak a sports science language. And it is, again, I think to, uh, to echo what was said earlier, it starts slowly and just a couple of messages. So this is what we are, this is what we want to do. So when I worked at British Cycling, the brands, want, the brands wanted to be in the gym with the riders all the time. They wanted to be filming training all the time. It was like, no, 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 back off, right? If, if we can just allow one of the brands to come in, take some photos while the guys are in the gym, plan what we're gonna do, tell the coaches what that's going to look like and make sure that nobody's gonna be inconvenienced then everyone becomes that, just that bit more comfortable. The coaches have to be a key part of this. They have to be, they have to understand what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And also, look, it, 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 I guess where we get quite lucky is often we come in with, I guess, quite cool brands. You know, like Vodafone want to come in and do something quite cool or AWS do, or, or you know, someone from Wimbledon wants to come in. Actually, we can play to coaches and sports scientists' ego slightly. Um, and that does work for us. But I would say our, our routine has been very much what was said earlier. Keep it simple. Don't, if, if you get an agreement with a coach or a sports scientist, stick at that. Don't break any trust and you will build from there. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Uh, I would like to open the floor for other questions, if you have any. Please, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. I uh, just have a question around, like you mentioned, the ethics. We have people who decide what kind of cars can be driven in Formula One in terms of how much they weigh and what goes on. We have people who decide on what kind of drugs or can, athletes can or can't take. Um, same thing, I guess, with nowadays. Um, it's becoming more and more prominent. The conversation around, you know, do are transgender athletes allowed to perform in certain sports and what the rules look like for them. With regards to ethics and data, um, who sets the, 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 the minimum guidelines? Who's the governing body who manages that? And how do you think that will evolve uh, going forward as we continue to collect more and more data? Yeah, it's a good question. And the answer is, we don't know. So there, there isn't a governing body for sport who will oversee that at the moment. It's kind of comes back to each NGB on a case by case basis. That project red card, it's a commercial venture. So, you know, I, I think we have to be a little bit careful about saying that you know, they're kind of leading the way because there's ultimately they're sports agents who are trying to drive more revenue for their athletes themselves. Um, what I would say is there's probably 
a difference between performance data that we can all see because we all turn up and watch sports. So we see people, you know, run, jump, et cetera, et cetera. When you start to go internal, I think that's when it starts to become a question. With the Track Champions League, all the athletes signed waivers. So that might be where we go. But again, we have to make sure that we are clear in the data that we're getting from them and what we're going to publish and how and why so that people, I think as, they, as long as they understand what they're signing up to and we're bound by those boundaries, then, then I think it's okay. But you have to be clear and you have to set boundaries and parameters. Does that, does that answer? Yeah, a bit of a snooze fest when you start to go more into the detail, but I think it's important to consider it because it's, we have all of this opportunity, but then you know, if we explore it, might we get ourselves into legal trouble if someone disagrees? And yeah. So minimum, then it could be like, well, you're in for a red tape. Yeah, I mean, think about it like a club. If you've, if you've got a player who may have a chronic injury, and you're publishing data that shows their output's going down and down and down. That can affect their career or you know, their next club. So it, it's then when actually you sort of hope everyone's just a little bit sensible um, and you know, there's just a little bit more thought about it rather than just trying to pump out data for the sake of it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Alex, just please. Up, Mary, can you, if I'm the fasting the cyclist, so they, they sign and they permission yeah. What if one doesn't? Then we don't take their data. So, you, you, so you could exclude, they could be the results, like winner, we can't tell you. How many yeah, so every, every rider is issued with heart rate monitors. They've got power monitors. Um, there's three or four monitors on each bike. So you just say, okay, we won't, we won't bother. From the marketing point of view, you pray they don't win. Um, yeah, that would be indirect coercion if you want to be part of this industry. But uh, cycling's relatively easy, particularly track cycling, because it's not a hugely well-paid. It's not a hugely well-paid sport. So the top riders in the world are showing up. They get paid. Cycling quite a data-heavy sport, so it's not un unusual for them to be wearing heart rate monitors and to to have that data out there. Um, there will be bigger challenges than than cycling. That's for sure.